Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the September meeting of the uh, Parents Advisory Council. Uh, this week is the week before we go back to school, and that is on Monday, September 14th. We are looking very much forward to that. Um, I think in anticipation of the first week back to school, uh, next week we will um, not have a PAC meeting on Thursday as it stands right now, but we will be back on on September 24th and we'll do a check in there to see how everything is going. Um, so uh, again, um, I wanna thank our community and the members of our Parents Advisory Council. Um, and just a reminder, our Parents Advisory Council are uh, your friends and neighbors. They are volunteers who serve our school community and provide input on school policies and procedures, and they um, are very valuable um, in the um, information they share with the school district. So without further ado, let's turn to the slides for this evening. And we'll go to our agenda. Um, so we have an update on athletics. There's some uh, breaking news there. I'm gonna talk about the transportation test run that's coming up. Um, uh, we'll go through uh, a review of the self-attestation procedure, uh, health guidelines, overview our schedule, um, talk about um, our administrative leadership team update, review our K3 model, our 4-6 model, um, some breaking news on CYC. And tonight we're going to focus on remote learning and um, we will review some of the elementary, but the main focus will be on remote learning 712. And of course, we will leave you with who to contact with. So let's go to the first slide and that will be an update on athletics. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the, athlete, the athletic update is um, that uh, um, the, the state will be permitting on less than 20%. Um, I think someone, if someone could mute in the background, that would be great. Okay, thank you. So um, New York State will uh, be permitting uh, practices and competition in low to moderate risk activities. Low to moderate risk activities are defined as golf, tennis, soccer, field hockey, cross country, and swimming and diving. And this will begin Monday, September 21. That is a week from this Monday. And uh, last evening, uh, the New York State Public High School Athletic Association uh, declared that high risk sports, originally they were opening those sports to uh, practice starting September 1, uh, but they have delayed practice and possibility of competition that's for football, volleyball, and cheerleading, and that has been deferred until the 1st of March. Um, we will be holding a full sports parent information night, um, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, September 16. Um, so that will be held next week, and we'll be getting out more uh, information on that. The next one is just more of a heads up. So uh, tomorrow, we're gonna be doing a live dry bus run. Um, so all of our drivers and our bus aides are going to be reporting at their regularly scheduled times. They'll drive their routes without students. So um, this is only a test. Um, don't be uh, alarmed uh, if you see a bus coming into your neighborhood. Um, it's not that you uh, woke up and it's Monday morning or that you know, we snuck a fast one on you and decided to start school on Friday. This is just us uh, going through uh, a trial uh, of our buses to see uh, how the timing will work out. So uh, thank you. And um, you know, as I say, you will see buses in your neighborhood. Um, don't worry about that. And if your neighbors have some concerns, you can uh, communicate that to them as well. Um, now I will turn it over to Ms. Bongermino, who will be uh, reviewing the district self-attestation procedure. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Kaur. So we talked about this last time, so um, this is just a brief update as to where we're at. We've been uh, working diligently with our company called um, Pinpoint and been testing the software with staff. Um, we had a few little hiccups, but nothing that was 
uh, anything we weren't expecting. So um, this self attestation is something that all students and staff will have to do prior to coming into school every day. Um, we again have been testing it with staff and we anticipate doing a test with students either Friday or Saturday. Um, certainly it will come as an email to the student's email account, um, but we're also working on the text component of that and making sure that we have all of the right uh, text numbers. So keep an eye open for that. And it's really easy once you get the text or the email, there is a link right, embed right embedded into the um, information. You click the link and you answer the questions and provided you answer no to all the questions, you are good to go. So um, again, parents and staff will get this every morning. Um, if for some reason a parent or staff member uh, forget to do it or they just don't have time in the morning or whatever, um, or they just don't get the link for whatever reason, um, there will be a generic uh, link on the parent portal that you can use as a backup. So if for some reason you wake up and the text is not there, just go to the parent portal click on the link and the only thing more you'll probably have to do is just fill in the student's name. Um, but the ones that you get specifically to the student's email or the text will be specific to that student. So you won't have to put their name in. Um, so again, it is that self attestation question. Have you been diagnosed with COVID? Have you been uh, around somebody that's been diagnosed with COVID? Have you traveled to a restricted state? Um, are you showing any COVID-like symptoms and doing that temperature check as well, where you have to have a temperature of uh, less than 100.0 degrees um, in order to be cleared to come to school. We do know there's some families that are going to be needing thermometers. They are on order. According to, I think, Amazon, they are in transit. So our hope is we will have those for Monday. Um, if not, don't worry, we'll have the kids come in and we'll have them checked by the nurse and then um, we'll be able to get them into the classroom. So uh, just bear with us. Again, there's a lot of moving pieces and, and we're, doing, we're doing a lot of uh, really good work. So again, we are gonna have an option for parents or students that don't have smartphones. So if you don't have the texting capability or you don't have internet access, we will have a paper option that will be available so that parents can send the paper information in with the student so that they can just then go right to the classroom. Uh, Jenna, we have a question in the chat. Is the attestation being sent to the child's email or the parents, please clarify. My understanding it's going to the student's email, um, but if Julie Scriven, oh, Julie Scriven is saying it's both. She's our IT director. So uh, it's going to both the student's email and the parent's email. So that's good. And then for those families that need to um, have the attestation in a language other than English, we have had them translated in all our major languages, which I think we had about 10 different languages. So parents will be able to choose which language they would prefer to have that attestation in, and then they would be able to answer it based on that information. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, again, health guidelines, these are all coming from the New York State Department of Health and CDC. Nothing's really changed from the last meeting, but we would just uh, like to go over these briefly. So here are our COVID related symptoms. So if a student or staff member is exhibiting any one of these, one or more, then they are required to stay home. And that is that fever of 100.0 degrees or higher shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, runny nose or congestion, fatigue, muscle or body aches, cough, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. So if a student or staff member is experiencing one of these symptoms, then they will need to answer the attestation that it is a yes, and then follow our return to school protocol. Um, Jenna, before we go any further here, I just saw Dr. Saida um, enter, the, uh, enter this meeting here, and I'd like to thank Dr. Saida uh, because Dr. Saida sent the uh, link to a conference with uh, the uh, uh, contagious <laughs> disease uh, folks of three leading Boston area hospitals, and Dr. Fauci was the key speaker there. So, speaker there. So, this is an interesting. Uh, <laughs> on uh, uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs>
<laughs> That's great. Um, okay, so this slide comes from Harvard Medical School. So this is this is a new slide for us, but it just shows how the COVID symptoms do uh, present themselves. So uh, mostly it is fever. So if there is a fever, then you know, there is much a, a much higher incidence that it might be COVID related. Cough, fatigue, uh, anorexia, which is not feeling like you want to eat at all. Shortness of breath, 31 to 40 percent, and then a general malaise, which is just you just don't feel good. So, um, but again, there's a lot of other non-specific symptoms reported, and so it's just really important for parents and for staff to to assess your child or yourself before coming into school because we really want everybody to be as healthy as possible before walking in the door. Mr. Core, did you have anything else on that slide? Um, nope, I think that's you know that's that's pretty much it. So I think, you know, again, you know, the the frequency of the uh, presentation of symptoms. Is, I think, a good okay. So there's, uh, as we talked about before, there's some some parental responsibilities and some and some school responsibilities regarding this. So parents will be responsible for doing that health assessment every morning, checking for those COVID symptoms. How does your student feel today? Are they, are they good and they're happy and ready to go? Or are they got that general malaise or are they running a fever? You will be required to do that temperature check as well. And again, we will be supplying thermometers to those families that need it. Um, we would suggest that you just make that request to the main office at your buildings. And then as soon as we get them in, we will supply them to you. Um, and then submit that self-attestation either through the app or through the, um, the email. And again, if uh, the child has one or more of these COVID-related symptoms, the child must stay home. Please call that absence into school and be very specific about what symptoms that child has um, because that's gonna be really important for our school nurse. Um, if there are any COVID-related symptoms, like I'm keeping my child home because they have a cough and, and a fever, the nurse is gonna follow up with, with the student and with you to, to see how things are going. And again, you must follow that return to school protocol. Um, so in the chat, I just see something about seasonal allergies. So we have had a lot of questions about this. So what our guidance has been is if your child suffers from seasonal allergies, when that time comes where the, the child is, a, is showing those symptoms. They still need to go to the doctor, get that alternate diagnosis, get the negative COVID test. But in that doctor's note, they can say that this symptom is due to allergies and will present as a runny nose all the time. If that happens, then we can use that doctor's note and that negative COVID test. However, if additional symptoms come up, that now the child has a cough or things of that nature, then the child will have to go back to the doctor and get another negative COVID test. And so Christy, like, yeah, I'm sorry, Ms. Bonjamino, are you set? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, Christy Rivera had a question about, is it considered a legal absence if the child needs to stay home pending a negative COVID test or if they are awaiting a recommended duration before returning to school? The answer is yes, it is a legal uh, uh, absence. Super. So, um, and we have had um, some calls from some pediatric practices asking questions about this procedure. I know that this is not a North Colony uh, edict. This is coming from the Department of Health. So we were, we've have had conversations with Albany County, with Dr. Whalen, and everybody's very clear that this is what the guidance is telling us right now, that it has to be the doctor's visit with the diagnosis and the negative COVID test. Um, if that guidance does change from the Department of Health, we will certainly let you know, but right now that's the guidance that we're following. Um, as far as the school's responsibility, we are going to confirm that the calls from some, we're gonna confirm that the da daily attestation has been done prior to the student entering into the classroom. And that's part of the work that we're doing right now, ensuring that we have all of the information as far as student schedules and homerooms and, and making sure that the teachers have what they need prior to the students actually entering into that classroom. Uh, if, there, if the student is there and there is no attestation, you know, they forgot, it happens, um, that's okay. We're just gonna direct them to a designated area where they're going to be 
assessed by um, a trained individual, they're gonna get their temperature checked and provided they're not showing any COVID related symptoms and their temperature is under 100.0, they're gonna be returned to the classroom so that they can start their day. However, if they do present with um, COVID-like symptoms or their temperature is greater than 100.0, and that could be in the morning or any time during the day, then they're gonna be moved, you know, brought to the nurse and the nurse will move them into an isolation room where they will be um, treated and the parents will be called to come get the, picket, get, get the child for pickup. And again, following that return to school protocol. Okay, so uh, our return to school protocol, as, as I've mentioned, um, this is for students and staff that again, if you're having one of these symptoms, you have to get a doctor's note with an alternate diagnosis and proof of a negative COVID test or remain out of school or work for at least 10 days. If you're still symptomatic after those 10 days, you, you cannot come back. You have to be symptom free you have to be um, fever free for at least 24 hours without fever reducing medication and no nausea, or no vomiting or diarrhea. So it's just really important to know that this is something that we will be following um, for, for both students and for staff. Um, if, for, uh, if we do get a positive COVID test, then obviously we will be contacting Albany County or they will be contacting us, but we will be working hand in glove with them and following their guidance is regarding quarantine, isolation, procedure. Um, and then people that have that positive COVID test can only return upon being cleared by the Albany County Department of Health and also following our North Colony guidelines. Um, so we have a question here. Um, from Stephanie, can you clarify for families with multiple students in the district, if one child in a family is sent home because of a suspected COVID case, will the other children perhaps in other schools also be sent home? The answer so, is no. Yeah, oh. the answer is no, because um, so the, the way it will work is, is this, if um, we have a positive diagnosis of a COVID case, Albany County Department of Health will begin the process of contact tracing. They will be, uh, students or individuals will be identified as direct contacts. Those direct contacts will be asked to quarantine for 14 days and be um, uh, recommended for COVID testing, most likely at the expedited clinic over at U Albany. Yeah. And then also too, so uh, with the example of a student who in the middle of the day starts to present, let's say with a cough and a runny nose and they have another sibling at, that's at another building, we're going to send the student with the symptoms home. That doesn't mean that the other student in the other building will be sent home if, they're, if, they're being, if they are asymptomatic. It would only be, the only impacted individuals would be those identified as direct contacts. Yes. Uh, Dina, uh, allude. Do parents need to call the school every day with updated symptoms absence while awaiting the 10 days or uh, test result? Um, I, don't, it, I don't, it is not a re requirement. Um, I, I think um, it would be helpful uh, to us for certain um, mm -hmm. that um, if you have an individual uh, who was uh, asymptomatic, but tested positive, and then became symptoms. I think that would be helpful for us to know, but not required. But the short answer to your question, parents do not need to call the school with an update. Mm -hmm. um, if, at, if families should have issues from Karen with the app regarding attestation, should they send a signed note in with the student? The weekend is tight to troubleshoot. I think uh, that's, that, appropriate. that's yeah and that's a, a really good idea yes. yeah I totally I agree with that especially until we get things up and running again we we were hopeful that we would have tested this earlier but just due to timing it just didn't happen another um, question just I thought of that we got today from a parent um, you're going to get one attestation if for all your kids, so let's say you have four children, you're gonna get one attestation for the four children. 
if one child is exhibiting symptoms, you're going to answer yes on the attestation. And then it's going to lead you to another screen saying, which child is this? So it may be that, you know, Johnny is exhibiting symptoms, but the other three children are not. The other three can go to school, but Johnny needs to stay home because he is exhibiting the symptoms. So you don't have to do an, a, an attestation for every single child, every single day. It's more like for the family. And then the, if there's an anomaly, then you're gonna specifically target what child we're talking about. So hopefully that make that easier for parents. Okay. Um, and then immunizations, just know that um, regardless of what platform you've chosen uh, for schooling for your children, either if you went with hybrid, in-person or remote, you need to make sure that all of your New York State immunizations are up to date. Our nurses will um, be contacting you if they are out of date and you have up to 14 days to get them done or um, you will not be able to continue with school. And I believe that is it. And these are our, our uh, COVID screening protocols. Um, we um, were given a the site last week about where to search for the site closest to you. We need to get that up there. Sure. Um, but are there any uh, any other questions at this point? Okay, so. Okay. Um, Let's go. Thank you, Ms. Bongiorno. So um, now we'll go to Ms. Skills and we'll do the uh, school schedule schedules K6 and do the overview here. K6 and of course 712. Okay, so as everyone on the pack I know uh, is aware, but just in case we have new viewers tonight, we will have our K through six students divided up between K3 at their home elementary buildings and four six at the junior high school. So Forts Ferry and Southgate will be the early elementary schools, although no one's particularly early this year. Um, K3 at Forts Ferry and at Southgate, their school day will be 8.45 to 2.15. And the four six counterparts will be at the junior high school building from nine to two. Blue Creek, Bout Hills, Latham Ridge and Loudonville will be the later elementary schools. K3 in their home buildings from 945 till 315 and grades four through six will be at the junior high school building from 10 to three. If your child is in an elementary program and is remote, it actually doesn't matter which elementary school they're in. It just matters if they're K3 or four six. So K3 elementary remote is 930 to 215 and grades four six is nine to 230. For seven through 12, for our junior high school students and our high school students, they will have a hybrid model, which means they will be doing part of their schooling in person and part of their schooling virtually online. Um, they will be sharing the high school building for their in-person, so we are, have them on split shifts. So the way it will work is the junior high school students in grades seven and eight will go to Shaker High School daily from 7.30 to 11 for their in-person instruction. Then there will be a break in the middle of the day for them to travel home and get lunch. And then they will have virtual classes in the afternoon from 1240 to 235. Their high school counterparts in grades nine through 12 will have just the opposite. They will start virtually at their house from 815 to 1030. They will attend school in, per in person from 1145 to 345 p.m. in the afternoon. However, they will be going on an every other day basis. So students are assigned either north or south. North students are those families whose residences are in Bout Hills, Forts Ferry, and Latham Ridge zones. South students are Blue Creek, Loudonville, Manan, Southgate, and any other students um, who are tuition paying. They are in the south zone. This is a revised high school schedule because if you missed last week, we've changed the time. Um, so 8.15 is when the virtual classes will begin. It had been 8.30, so it backed up 15 minutes so we could finish by 10.30 to allow for travel time because we built in now a home base period. This is a multi-use period for students as they're arriving into school to get to their first period or their eighth period class, depending on what day it is. 
They'll go directly to their class. They won't be able to go throughout the building this year. They'll have to go directly to a classroom to um, enforce social distancing. But once they're in that classroom, they can use their Chromebooks. They can um, meet with a teacher. All teachers will be in homerooms. They could do um, a Zoom call with a teacher to get extra help. They could use it to do some homework. And then their class would begin right at 1210. They could also pick up lunch while they're on their way in so that they could eat their lunch before their class began at 1210. And then they would segue right into their first period class. And the school day would end at 345 as opposed to four. So it's shifted from 815 to 345 as opposed to 830 to four, which was the original schedule. So many people have asked questions. If the students are moving, are their teachers moving? Are the administrators moving? So we have aligned our administrators a little bit differently in order to provide the appropriate supervision in each of our buildings. So our K-3 students, as we've said, will be in their home elementary schools and their building principles will remain the same. So if you are in Latham Ridge, Mr. Thiel is the K-3 principal in Latham Ridge. Our junior high school physical building has become almost an intermediate elementary school. It's where our four through six students will be housed. The building and administrative team there will be Mr. Chamberlain. Davis Chamberlain is the principal of the junior high school. Ms. Lauren Sheeler. Lauren is a dean at the high school in Taft Hall, and she will be moving to the junior high school. And Ms. Thea McFawn. Ms. McFawn has been working at Bout Hills as the building assistant to Mr. Puccioni. She will be moving to the junior high school. Each of these three administrators will be the liaison to two different home buildings. So for example, Ms. McFawn already knows the Bout Hills students, knows the Bout Hills teachers, so she will clearly be the Bout Hills liaison. So each principal will be contacting the elementary building principal if they have questions, if they need assistance with a child, or reaching out to a counselor if they need a consult. So our seventh and eighth grade students, as we've just talked about, will be in the high school in the morning. The building administrative leads will be Mrs. Dawn Lang. Mrs. Lang is a hall principal in the junior high and Mrs. Crystal Fox and Mrs. Fox is a hall principal in the high school. So the two of them will be the lead administrators for the seventh and eighth graders. They're two very experienced administrators for that. Our nine through 12 students will be in the high school. They will be there in the afternoon. The building administrative team will be Mr. Richard Murphy, who is our high school building principal, Mr. Brian Spofford, who is one of our hall principals at the high school, and Mr. Garrett Kucher, who is one of our high school deans. So the three of them will be the lead administrators. We understand, however, that Mrs. Lang and Mrs. Fox will be in the building if they need to help out, and quite the same that Mr. Murphy or Mr. Spofford or Mr. Kucher could help out in the morning, but those two people, Mrs. Lang and Mrs. Fox, will be the lead administrators for 7-8. And those three, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Spofford, and Mr. Kucher, will be the lead for 9 through 12. Our students in 7th through 12th grade, special education students, are supported by Mr. Casey Barden, who is our director of pupil services, as well as Ms. Beth Bissell, our assistant director of PPS, and Ms. Tia Washington, our other assistant director of PPS. So that team of three will support our secondary special education students. So we'll segue right to our K through three model review. Um, again, just reminding you early schools, um, Southgate always was an early school, but for Forts Ferry folks, um, early, although it was very close to the time they were typically in school, 8.45 to 2.15. The other four will be the late schools. We want you to know one thing that we're really proud of is that our students in North Colony will continue to have their special area classes. We have um, had a long commitment to a well-rounded education for our students. It was challenging to do in the midst of this pandemic to be able to staff our schools appropriately, but we were committed to having our art teachers teaching art and our music teachers teaching music and not simply supervising classes. So we're really proud that for K-3 and 4-6, our elementary students will have access to all their special area classes that round out their educational program. So one question, I just alluded to is, well, staffing. You might have heard in some other school districts that art teachers, music teachers, PE teachers are being used as classroom supervisors. And perhaps there are even some schools who are not able to offer specials. 
And we understand that if you're watching the news, you know this is a very challenging economic climate for schools in New York State. All kinds of schools had to make the plans that they could with the resources available to them. So while our special area teachers will be teaching special area classes, who will be working with your child as a classroom teacher? So it could be a returning classroom teacher. It could be a teacher who was a third grade teacher last year, who's back again this year, and that person is now um, a third grade teacher. Certainly the special area teachers who are returning are gonna work with your students and their subjects. You could have a newly hired teacher. So you might get a name and think, I haven't heard that name before. Well, last year we had 11 retirements at the elementary level. And we also added three sections even before the pandemic, we knew because of the growth in this district. So there are 14 brand new members of the North Colony teaching community. We're excited, they're wonderful, they're excited to meet your children. But if you see a name you don't know, it could be that it's a newly hired teacher. You might have an elementary reading specialist who will be working in classrooms. They are certified classroom teachers. You might have a math specialist. They are also certified elementary classroom teachers. So they will be helping to teach some of our students because obviously, as you know, we had to reduce class size in order to enforce the six foot social distancing. So we needed more teachers. And in addition to those just named, we also have something we call the North Colony Teacher Force. We started the North Colony Teacher Force last year, quite honestly, because we were aware of the number of teachers we have in North Colony who are reaching retirement age. We're aware of the data in the state of the number of teachers across the state who are, or who are reaching retirement age. And we're also aware of the lower numbers of teachers in college who are training and ready to become teachers. There is a supply and demand problem on the horizon and that was before the pandemic. So we borrowed an idea from private industry and said, how can we get some teachers into our district and have them train with our, our senior teachers before they retire? We are so happy when our teachers retire and they get to go to the next stage of their life. Of course, we're happy for them, but we're also sad because a wealth of knowledge, that experience that they have from years of working with students goes out the door with them. So we came up with this idea that we would bring in newly certified teachers and have them work alongside classroom teachers, have them participate in professional development with North Colony um, instructional coaches or with Mr. Janine or with me and really bring them up so that they can be the next generation of teachers in North Colony. Several of our newly hired teachers actually were teacher force members last year. And we've also had some teacher force members be hired by other districts. So we're really proud of that program. This year, our teacher force members are either returning AIS support teachers who had been working in our building or they're newly certified elementary teachers that we hired this year, just like we hired a group last year. And they are going to be working in partnership with a classroom teacher on planning and lesson design. So in certain sections where we needed to have an extra, an extra classroom, so we, we had to have one extra classroom where we could split 12 students here and 12 students there. In some cases, we have a classroom teacher paired with one of our newly certified elementary teacher force members. The classroom teacher will work in collaboration with the teacher force member on lesson planning and lesson design. And they will schedule so that the classroom teacher, for example, might teach ELA and math and the teacher force might teach science and social studies and they might switch at half day so that they can then have English and social studies now to group two taught by the classroom teacher and, or English and math, excuse me, and science and social studies taught to group one by the teacher force member. It's a different version of our teacher force program, but we're really invested in this model. And there's a couple of reasons why. As I just mentioned, they'll spend half their day receiving instruction from their classroom teacher and half receiving it from a certified teacher who has co-planned and designed the lesson with the classroom teacher. Unlike many districts in this region, our students will not be supervised by an uncertified person while watching a teacher instruct in another classroom via a computer. That is one of the ways that many of our districts in the region have solved the staffing problem. The classroom teacher is in one room, half the students, 
The other half of the students are in a room across the hall or down the hall, perhaps a certified teacher or an uncertified person will be supervising them and they'll simply be watching their teacher on the computer. We really wanted to avoid that model in any way that we could because we know in real time, we want our students to be able to ask questions. We want our students to interact. And in this case, our students will interact with a certified teacher who is with them for their primary instruction. That also means we did not have to pull our special area teachers away from their subjects where they have expertise to just be supervisors of students and just cover classes. So in this way, we feel that this model helps our students to work with certified teachers. It also allows us to contribute to the profession by bringing in new teachers into our field, which is going to be very important as we move forward. And it preserves the wide range of special area subjects that are so enjoyed by our, by our students and critical to their academic growth and development. We will be social distancing our students in all classroom spaces. Um, this is true K3, 4, 6, 7, 12, doesn't matter. Student desks have been um, spaced six feet apart. We will be using signage to make sure that um, hallway traffic is reduced into bidirectional, so it's one way so that we can keep students more easily separated. Travel around the building will be limited, especially in K3. And each building is taking steps to reduce the density of students at arrival and dismissal at your individual building meetings. Your principals have talked to you about that. It's slightly different as you can imagine in each building because of the layout and traffic patterns. And lunches will be delivered to classrooms to avoid crowded cafeteria lines. We will have our students uh, spaced apart in the classrooms and the lunches will be there. As a result, all of our classrooms will be um, peanut free, and uh, tree nut free for this school year. Our four through six model, again, reminder that they will be in Shaker Junior High School. That has become our intermediate school, if you will. The building has been divided up and I know many of you have been on tours that Mr. Chamberlain, Ms. Sheeler, Ms. McFawn and several of our teachers have been leading over the past week. Um, so you've probably seen this if you are a parent of fourth or sixth. So it's divided by elementary zone. There are uh, signs outside the building that say, welcome Southgate, welcome Mount Hills. They will operate on two separate schedules. So Fort Ferry and Southgate will start at nine where the other buildings will start at 10. And therefore Fort Ferry and Southgate will end at two and the other buildings will end at three. They too will have the full range of special area classes as we were just discussing. And CYC has before and after care options for grades four through six students. And we'll share those with you when we get to that portion of the evening. For four through six, Mr. Chamberlain and his team, they have been working very specifically on safety measures. So students will enter and exit through their assigned school door. So that's based on their school zone. They will remain with their cohort in their room for their day with the exception of breaks and recess so that they will be in one space. They won't be traveling across the building. There are dedicated student restrooms in each school zone, so they do not have to go out of that wing of the building to use a restroom. They do not have to leave their zone to get lunch, as we just spoke of. We um, scheduled many of the fourth grade classes in science rooms, so they have sinks right in there, so that for the youngest learners, at least in this building, the teachers can have a better eye on the students uh, practicing those good hand-washing skills, which we know are very necessary. We are modifying the emergency drills by zone so that there's um, minimal exposure to other students and we can keep students safe even as we practice our safety drills. And the pickup and drop off plan has been developed. And I know Mr. Chamberlain and his team have been talking to our fourth or sixth parents about that, just like our elementary uh, principals have been talking about the K through three pickup and drop off plan. If you do have any questions about that, you can certainly reach out to Mr. Chamberlain and he can answer questions for you. Okay, um, Mr. Core, would you like to talk about CYC? I would love to. So um, our CYC, so this is an interim plan with CYC. So let me just explain why it's an interim plan. So 
Um, there is, uh, as you can imagine, there is a uh, substantial increase in the state for uh, demand for child care facilities. And New York State, particularly the Office of uh, Children and Families, um, is delayed in their process of, pro of approving facilities. So therefore, um, essentially, uh, we've altered our plan until Goodrich is approved for programming because we were going to use Goodrich as the site for um, our, our students in grades four or six. So we do anticipate an approval in two to four weeks. Um, there will be no diminished capacity to provide uh, child care and the county, uh, uh, county youth will, uh, county youth center will keep families updated as to the progress of the approval process. Um, in the meantime, this is the plan beginning September 14. So um, for K-6, now this is all K-6. All K-6 students will have CYC before school in their home elementary buildings. I'll repeat that again, all K-6 students will have CYC before school in their home elementary buildings. Forts Ferry and Southgate will open at seven and they will be open from seven to 8.30 staffed by CYC. Blue Creek, Bout Hills, Latham Ridge, Loudonville will also be open from seven to 8.30 staffed by CYC from 8.30 until dismissal time um, to classrooms at 9.30. So during that 8.30 to 9.30 time, we will have North Colony staff uh, provide supervision for students. Now, aftercare, um, so K-6, um, and this is for Blue Creek, Bout Hills, Latham Ridge, Loudonville, and Southgate. They will be at the home elementary school. So here's the breakdown for that. So, um, excuse me, Southgate will be open from two to six. Um, North Colony uh, staff will staff it from two to three and CYC will staff uh, from three to six. Blue Creek, Bout Hills, Latham Ridge and Loudonville will be open from three to six staffed by CYC. Uh, K3, will stay at Forts Ferry. So Forts Ferry will be open from two to six. North Colony staffers will staff the program from two to three and CYC staff will come in and staff from three to six. Grades four through six will be operated at the CYC's uh, facility at Avis Drive. That's their central location and our students will be transported by a North County school bus from uh, the junior high to Avis Drive at the end of the day for their aftercare. I um, wanna emphasize here that CYC follows the health, same health and safety protocols of social distancing, mask wearing, health screenings. They've been uh, providing childcare since March. And uh, the CYC does still have openings if parents are interested uh, they can contact CYC directly. And um, after this interim plan concludes, um, we will update you on the uh, plan going forward. But we are in good shape. We have plenty of space and coverage um, for uh, our students under this plan. And we will be able to accommodate childcare. Okay, so now we will move to remote learning. And just to let you know, we have designated administrators who are overseeing our remote learning um, programs. So for K through six, our remote principal will be Mr. Brian Deneen, who is our Director of Teaching, Learning and Innovation for the district. We have 33 remote sections scheduled for K through six. We have over 700 students enrolled and there was a parent meeting for elementary families who are opting for remote learning last night. Um, and there is a link here, and this will be posted on the district website. So you can 
either go and see the, the meeting is on the district website already, but there's also a link within this PowerPoint. And we'll hit on a few of the highlights in just a moment. And then for seven through 12, so we just divided this to elementary and secondary. Our seven through 12 remote principal will be Mr. Jan Zadorian. Mr. Zadorian has been a hall principal at the high school and a hall principal at the junior high school. So he knows both programs very well. So he's well suited to do this work. We have 625 students enrolled in 7 through 12 remote instruction. And we're happy to say that through very creative scheduling and a lot of hard work, we will be able to offer the vast majority of our courses to students in remote instruction. And we're very proud of that fact. Um, it has not been easy to achieve. We're going to talk about some changes tonight that uh, the road to get there was uh, twisty at best but we think we're in a very good place now. and We're very excited to share that with you. It's been a lot of creativity and it's been a lot of hard work. Um, Mrs. Fox and Mr. Spofford at the high school taking the lead on that work and Mr. D Mr. Zadrian and Mrs. Lang at the junior high school taking the lead on that work. And it has been um, 24 seven in the last couple of weeks. So uh, I'm going to turn this over right now to Mr. Deneen. Um, he did a great job last night talking to our parents, and I'm going to have him just hit on some of the highlights of our elementary K-6 learning program. Good evening. Uh, nice to see you all virtually. So we talked a little bit last night about what the day will look like for your K-3 learner. Here's an example schedule, as you'll see. We'll have morning meeting as well as afternoon meeting. And what I talked to the group last night about was the importance, frankly, that we connect with our students. They've been out of school for five or six months. We need to designate time to see how people are doing, to introduce ourselves to one another, to smile a bit together, and, and frankly, to build that community that is always important and always a challenge, but I would argue even more so while we're doing it via the computer screen. So we're going to see that K-6. You look at the day, we're looking at things such as 45 minute blocks for our academics like literacy and math, uh, science and social studies. But we're also going to have a special every day, art, music, PE and library. One of the differences is our specials will be asynchronous, which is that those will be recorded uh, in posted lessons as opposed to the live dynamic that we'll be having for the rest of the day between the remote teacher and his or her classroom. We're going to have a universal lunch and midday break. And we think that throughout the time uh, of the day, we'll be able to look at the importance of remediation, uh, reteaching and enrichment. That gives you an idea of what the K-3 day looks like. I think next might be four, six. So the four, six day uh, doesn't look drastically different, but here's, here's a difference. Uh, we're going to departmentalize in grades four and six. So you'll see that we have four blocks of time where teachers uh, will own one. We'll have a math teacher, an ELA teacher, science and social studies. What'll be unique because we are remote, <coughs> excuse me, is a student's ability to be with their teacher and then have to leave and join another uh, remote Google Classroom, let's say. It, it's that same thing that we do when we pack up our books and we walk down the hallway at Forts Ferry or at Loudonville, but here uh, we'll be leaving one Google Classroom and joining another live URL link to meet with my next teacher. Uh, you'll see also things like a special every day. We'll be having uh, music lessons for those instrumentalists in four through six. And we have that beginning and end of the day check-in because again, regardless of your age, uh, that, that attention to community, the social emotional priority that we have for our kids, uh, that'll serve us well all year. Uh, we mentioned special areas and I said the big difference, and this was probably one of the biggest pieces to share at our community meeting last night is that the specials are asynchronous they won't be talking and interacting with their art teacher or their librarian, but we will have them. And actually some of the more creative work that I saw during the spring was from our special area teachers who really used technology in an interesting way, whether it was getting people up and moving in PE with you know, a, a tape recording of some live movement 
or a wonderful, um, a wonderful music lesson, creating your own instrument, or a librarian that has uh, a dynamic interactive read aloud. So we're going to make the best of those, and we have a lot of terrific elementary uh, special area teachers who are going to be providing that work. Uh, we'll have 30 minute long PE and music and 45 minute long art and library. And we're, we've decided to move on a six day cycle, just like the home elementary school. And tomorrow's a big day. This has been a very demanding week everyone. Our rosters and our uh, classes straight because we wanted to find time tomorrow to be able to have uh, a pickup. So tomorrow we, we do have an organized pickup at each of the elementary schools so that um, parents can come in and we'll have a math book, let's say for most students, a phonics book for the K2 uh, folks. The truth is this is just the beginning. We will have to move forward and figure out what is the protocol about, let's say a monthly pickup potentially, so that we can make sure a trade book or a math manipulative is getting home so that we can use that through our remote, um, our remote classroom. So we have different times tomorrow and parents can pull up and we'll be ready. And uh, th this is, so Ms. Skills has talked to you a lot this summer about one of those things we've invested a lot of time in, which was kind of re-envisioning our website for our in-person classroom, should we go remote? We took a little different path when it came to having so many remote sections and frankly, almost 800 kids. What we did is wanted one single point of access. So instead of having a first grade website and a fourth grade website, we have a remote elementary website as you see before you. All thanks to Gary Cimarelli who uh, took the, the slightest of ideas and made it work so well. So this is where families will go on Monday. They'll go right to their grade level. They'll click on a grade. They'll see teacher names. And right there, if, if your teacher is Ms. Conroy, that's how you get into her room. So you go to the website, find your teacher, and you're in. And these, of course, uh, the Google Classroom codes would get you in. And then there'll be a live Zoom link there for Ms. Conroy's students to see her. And you'll note to the side, the same, this is the same place where you'll find your tabs to get to your library lesson, your music, or meet your ENL uh, teacher for that support. So it's a one-stop shop. We think it is uh, going to be helpful. I had some positive feedback from parents last night who thought, uh, thank you for letting us come to one place, especially if I have uh, a couple kids in remote school. I don't need to go to two or three different places to find my teacher. One stop and then I'm in. So uh, I think this will only get better as we go. So uh, by Sunday, this will be live and everyone's link will be work, working and will be exciting to go. And look at that, uh, fourth grade, they work as a team. They already have their schedule up. That's cool. It's cool. I haven't um, seen that actually. Mr. Janine, um, Lisa yes. has a question in the chat. Um, says, Brian, we got the teacher emails today for remote and they suggested we try to log in. Are the students' Chromebooks ready for that or did the link go to their email or do I need to put the web address in? Are the, are the computers ready for that? I'm not sure exactly what that means uh, in, and you could certainly check with your teacher tomorrow if you have your meet your new teacher uh, meeting, um, but everything should be ready to go. So from their Chromebook, and I'm sorry if I'm not answering the question well enough, they, they certainly should be able to access the classroom. The teachers will give you their Google Classroom code and you should be, be able to get right in. I don't, there, there will not be a computer problem. The computers are, no. are, are ready to. Um... Oh, so the URL. So Lisa, are you asking the question about this website, this URL, will it be displayed? We will certainly uh, make sure teachers share it with you so you have it. I don't believe as of this moment, it's on, uh, on the Chromebook or on the class link, but I know Gary said he would put it there. So stay tuned. I will check with him tomorrow to see where we are with that. Thank you, good question. So that's our website. 
We're excited about it. Thank you. Can, can I say one thing? One thing more. I, I sure. just would like, I'd like to say, depending who might be watching, uh, we, we did our very best to get out all of our classes today. There have been some hiccups. I have received some wonderful emails and questions uh, very respectfully. If you are unsure of who your teacher is or you've got something you're not quite sure of, by all means, uh, email me or call me. We're answering emails around the clock. And uh, we want to make sure all the kids get to the right class. And we're in a really good spot after today, but undoubtedly there are some hiccups still with, with this or that that we didn't see coming. So thank you ahead of time for your patience and let me know if we have to work out a kink. I think I know the answer to this question here from Sujatha. Our teacher meeting is pushed till Monday. So there will, will there be a link to log into the regular class on Monday? And I think there was a slide before it that gave this, the link. What, it's entitled, How Do We Start on Monday? We will get you that link. Your teacher meeting yep. on Monday, and, and this is a perfect example, your child's teacher was hired uh, two days ago, and we have not had her all set up with her email so that she could have a Google Classroom. So we got her contact information, and she said, I will reach out to all families, let them know. We'll meet Monday. So there's just a great example of where we're trying to figure our way through here but uh, I'm happy to say that she's with us now and that she's going to do a great job with that class. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'd like to say that um, she is a uh, teacher who was made available to us because of unfortunately some, some difficult circumstances in other local districts. So she is an experienced teacher who has a great deal to offer and will be an outstanding member of our team. So um, we're, yeah. we, we are fortunate um, that, that we were able to uh, get such a great experienced teacher. So we're going to move now to secondary remote learning. So this includes seventh and eighth graders who have a slightly different plan than obviously their ninth through 12th graders. But Mr. Jan Zadorian, as I mentioned before, will be Mr. Deneen's counterpart and he will be um, overseeing the seventh through 12th program. As I mentioned, Mr. Zadorian is one of the two main schedulers for the junior high school. He and Mrs. Lang have uh, been working round the clock truly to get the junior high school schedule done and have it fit and have it work beautifully. And I think they were down to something like 30 some odd last conflicts that they had to work out, which is an amazingly good number. And so he is not on the call tonight, but I have a lot of information to share with you. And I will start with the junior high and high school, some things they have in common, and then we'll detail some things that are specific to seventh and eighth grade and some things that are specific to ninth and twelfth grade. Okay, so 7th through 12th, first of all, all of our students in grades 7 through 12, whether you're a remote learner or a hybrid learner, they will be receiving their schedules, as we mentioned before, via the Infinite Campus Portal. So um, students will have their schedules, all will be getting them this weekend. We know it's really late. We know that um, causes people great stress, but we have the reason it's so late is that we are working so hard to meet every course request. And that is the truth. It, we could have had these to you earlier and we would have had many, many students who couldn't get the courses they wanted. And looking at the cost benefit analysis, we thought it was better to have it come out a little later and have really good schedules that are very workable for kids um, versus something that's done quickly and not as well. So what about our students in remote instruction? First of all, their schedule is going to look just like a schedule for a, their counterpart who's in the hybrid model. It'll have morning classes, afternoon classes listed. They'll have the periods listed. It'll say what class it is and it'll say who the assigned teacher is. So it'll say period one, science, Mr. Jones. And it will look exactly like anybody else's schedule. The time of the day for classes will be the same whether you are a remote student or a hybrid student. And I know that that can cause some head scratching thinking, well, boy, my, my kid who's home all day to do remote learning and they have to have this big gap in the middle. That is true. But the reason for that is 
some of our teachers have a blend of remote classes and in-person classes. So therefore, in order to make the, the schedules work, we have to have one common schedule. Otherwise, teachers would end up with overlapping classes because period two remote might conflict with period three in person. So that is why, but that also means that we are able to schedule classes with the teachers who are the teachers who typically teach those classes. So again, when we looked at it, we said we want our, our experienced teachers teaching these courses, and this is one of the ways we were able to accomplish that. Grading attendance, that's the, we have the same expectation for remote as for in-person learners. So there will be um, interim progress reports, there will be uh, quarterly report cards, and they will use the same traditional format that the junior high typically uses in the same traditional format that the high school typically uses. Okay, so let's talk a little bit just about seventh and eighth grade and what their schedule will look like. First, I'll try to paint a picture with words and then I'll try to show it to you. So hopefully between the two, you'll have a sense of it. So students in grades seven and eight will have their English, math, science, social studies, and world language classes with an in-person teacher daily during what is known as the morning session before that break. So in that time period from 7.30 to 11, that we're calling the morning session, they will have what we refer to as their core classes. Students will not take these classes in the afternoon. Their hybrid peers will have these courses in the afternoon because they have them every other day in person. So if you remember from the seventh and eighth grade schedule, if you're an in-person student on day one, you might have English and social studies in the morning in person. So in the afternoon, you have science and math. On day two, you'll have science and math in the morning and you would have your English and social studies in the afternoon. So if you think about it for a hybrid student, they have a little bit of a V schedule. I might have math in the morning, next day math in the afternoon, math in the morning, math in the afternoon. That's not the case for our remote learners. They will have their classes daily. So if you have English period one as a remote learner, you have English period one every single day, Monday through Friday with your teacher and your remote your remote counterparts. So those are all the kids taking English together who are remote learners. You have it period one, you have math period two every day. So you don't sit for it again in the afternoon because you're getting it every day in person. So the people who are hybrid get it morning, afternoon in that little V model I just showed you. And the students who are remote get it all morning long. So then what do they do in the afternoon? That's when they get their special area classes. So they'll have their art, music, health, technology, physical education, facts. Those will be offered in the afternoon. Students' afternoon schedules will look different because they're really customized to the learner that they are. So some students take a very specific program. For example, some students in eighth grade have high school level courses. So they may be sitting for an algebra course for high school credit or an earth science course for high school credit or a world language course or a DDE course for high school credit. They will be able to take those courses. Those courses will run a little bit later. They'll run from 255 to 345. But what that allows is those students to take that algebra course and still be able to earn that, um, that credit. They will not have to take a math in the morning. They will take their math in the afternoon. So you'll see the next schedule I show you is a sample. It won't be your child's exact schedule because it will depend if, if your child is taking um, health or if your child is taking a certain technology course. So we'll, we'll show you what a sample will look like. Many of our remote learners will have a study hall period or what we're calling an access period in the afternoon. This could be a period where they receive ENL services if they receive ENL services. It could be a period where they receive special education support if they receive special education support. It could be a period where they are just working on their homework, just like they would have had if they were in school. They would have had a study hall. They will have that period, but we call it an access period because it may be used for a pure study hall or it may be used for some kind of AIS support. There is a built-in after-school extra help period that has always been a tradition in our junior high school and in our senior high school that 
where teachers are available after the end of the traditional school day and students can um, make up work if they were absent or get some extra help on a project or just go over some material. So all remote learners, just like their in-person classmates will have access to that extra help period. And again, as I mentioned, their schedules will be individualized based on their programs. So here's a sample of what it would look like. So this is the remote schedule. If you were to go back through, you'd see a day in the life from August 20th, I believe, where we showed you a day in the life for seventh and eighth graders who were hybrid. And it would say under day one, group A. Day two would say group B, group A, group B. And it might say English and social studies here, and then math and science here. So you'll see for if your child is in seventh and eighth grade remote, Period one starts at 7.30. Um, the in-person students start at 7.10 because they have sort of a soft landing period where they can grab their breakfast and have breakfast and then instruction begins at 7.30. So if, again, you may have English period one or you might have it period three, but for example, notice that your child has English every day, social studies every day. This is a five day week. The slide just wasn't big enough. Um, math, they have their world language, um, which they, they have chosen and then they have their science class. So you'll see that they have them every day, which is why, as I mentioned, they don't repeat in the afternoon. So in the afternoon, this is a little harder to detail out because these classes rotate across the year. So for example, for one third of the year, they might, for one part of the year, excuse me, they have technology, for one part of the year they have facts, one part of the year they have art. So depending on how your child's been scheduled, they might start with art, or they might start with tech, or they might start with facts, but they would have one of those classes. Another rotation we have is PE, music, and health. And you can see that they have extra music and PE classes as part of their schedule. This is the same um, frequency with which their in-person peers are getting all their special areas. So they're getting the same special areas and they're getting them at the same rate of frequency. Um, this is the after school period, if you will. This is uh, what would typically be starting for us the regular school year at three o'clock. So classes end, if you will, at 2.05. And then 2.10 to 2.35 is where teachers are available for extra help and students can find ways to be able to um, zoom in and get extra help with a teacher should they want extra help or they need a little extra assistance with a project or something like that. So you can see the morning is your core subjects as we sometimes refer to them. And then your special area subjects happen in the afternoon. This period, it may not be period seven, it could be period eight again, depending on your child's individual schedule. But this is where I was mentioning the access period. So this could be if your child is in a support program where they might get support. This could be where your child is in study hall or it could be a combination thereof. Maybe they have access um, support two days a week and a study hall three days a week. Um, and all of these are individualized depending on if your child is receiving special education support or ENL support or other kinds of support throughout the day. This would also be a time where if a student wants to make an appointment with a counselor, please remember that our students who are on um, in remote learning, whether it's K6, 7, 8, or 9, 12, have full access to all the services that their in-person peers have. So if it's a social worker, if it's a counselor, if it's a psychologist, every student in the district whether you're remote or you're in-person as an elementary or hybrid as a secondary, you are North Colony kids. And we support all of you. And we support all of you with the full range of services that we offer. So whether it's an elementary counselor, whether it's a secondary guidance counselor, a social worker, a psychologist, all of those uh, assistance counselor, all of those support personnel are available to all of our students. It doesn't matter if you're in our brick and mortar school or you're at home. You're still our kids. So now we'll talk a little bit about nine through 12 because nine through 12 has had a bit of, of a change in the way we've gone about developing the schedule. And in order to understand sort of this twisty road I, I referred to all earlier, I thought it might be helpful to just talk a little bit about how the schedule gets developed and how it actually got developed this current year. So 
Obviously, if you have a student in ninth or 12th grade or you've had a child go through before, you know that the students um, in the springtime typically select with their parents the courses that they wanna take for the upcoming year. So the guidance counselors get those course selections, they input them into our Infinite Campus program. Then our academic supervisor, so our music supervisor, our English supervisor, our science supervisor, our art supervisor, et cetera, they then look at all the requests by grades and they decide, sorry about my phone, they decide how many sections of each course would be required based on the student selections and also based on the number of faculty we have. So they think about how many students asked for it, what's the appropriate class size, and then they start assigning those courses to the teachers who are certified and experienced in teaching those classes. I'm so sorry about my phone. Then they turn that information over to the high school hall principals, as I've referenced before. That would be Mrs. Fox, that would be Mr. Spofford, and they begin the process in May of putting together the Shaker High School schedule, and that ends in August. And that is a tremendous amount of work, as you can imagine, because our goal is always, just like it is at our elementary, our, our commitment is always to offer the children of North Colony the widest variety of courses that we possibly can. Because it is our commitment that when a child crosses the stage at graduation, he or she has found the thing that they love, where they feel a passion, an interest, something they're good at, something where they can make a mark. It's not just enough to cross the stage with a diploma. And so the more we can offer them from K right through 12, the more they can find their place. And that's part of what we think our commitment is as a public school. So in order to do that, we have to undergo an incredible schedule development so that we can offer this wide array. And we are very appreciative of such a supportive community that allows us to continue to do this for our students. So this year, obviously we didn't get to start in May. We weren't even sure whether we were gonna be open or not. We didn't know what the governor was going to say. So this has been an incredibly compressed timeline. As you'll remember, we did not receive our first guidance until the middle of July, and that was health and safety guidance. The uh, governor made his announcement at the beginning of August. So a process that would have begun in May now started in August, which is usually when it ends. It was also complicated by the fact that in other districts, they may still be running a nine through 12 schedule in their high school. We are not. We are now running a seven through 12 building. And so both the junior high schedulers and the high school schedulers had to create brand new half day schedules that would allow us to offer some version of in-person learning for our students in seven through 12, which is approximately 3,525 students. We know how important connection is. We know how hard it was for students to not have a connection. And so we knew we wanted to offer a remote option for our families who needed or wanted remote, but we also wanted to offer in-person for our families who needed or wanted in-person. So that required the creativity to say, we could run a split schedule. And then how do we look at our seventh and eighth graders who are younger, get them in as frequently as we can. So we now are happy to say our K through six students come in every day or are, are taught remotely every day. Our seven through 12 students have at least some time in the building every day or have remote classes every single day. And our high school ended up having to go on an every other day rotation. That's changed a couple of times if you've been following with the pack to make the best schedule possible. We don't stop until we get it as right as we can and school begins. And that happens in a regular year and that has certainly happened this year. So we had to create brand new schedules for two buildings. We had to create socially distant classroom environments, which for all intent and purposes meant dividing every class in half. Our classes are typically about 30. Our typical size classrooms can handle about 15 kids. We had to think about a way to do that. The North-South solution is what we landed on because that makes sense for transportation. 
so we could be more efficient because now our transportation director had to figure out all of these bus runs to have two groups of students, seventh and eighth graders, and ninth or twelfth graders running in the middle of the day. We had to balance classes with North and South students. So once we said, okay, we have in-person students, we have remote students. Well, we can't just say any 15 kids are in person because we have to make sure that we have the right North kids on the North days and the right South kids on the South days. We wanted to accommodate the needs of our remote learners and our remote teachers, just like we want to accommodate our in-person teachers and our in-person learners. And to the extent possible, and this was really our driver taking us to the nth hour. We wanted to offer that full catalog of courses to all students. If you need to be remote because of, of health reasons or fa family needs, you have every right to have an education that is the same as the kids who are coming in in person. And so we really had to keep looking at how could we do that and have students sitting with teachers who are our experienced North Colony teachers who are teaching those subjects. So initially, as we had talked about in earlier PACs, we thought, and you can see why this makes sense as you first think about it, that once we found out who our teachers are who would be remote, that it would be most efficient and effective if we were able to say, okay, here are our remote teachers, here are our remote students, let's match them up and let's make the schedule. Of course, that did not work out perfectly. We had more students, we had teachers with certain certifications who were remote, we had more teachers in this discipline who were remote and fewer in that discipline. In some disciplines, we had no remote teachers. So when we tried to make the model, um, Mrs. Fox, Mr. Spofford worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, and in true transparency, um, they reached out to Mr. Corrin to me this weekend and said, can we please meet with you? So uh, we met over Zoom on Sunday of Labor Day weekend. And at that point, despite them working 12 and 15 hour days, and this is not martyrdom, this is just, this is the truth of the energy that went into it. They were still unable to schedule over 900 students. And that was the two of them working with our chief information officer who knows Infinite Campus inside and out and Infinite Campus, the software, the company directors themselves. And we still had over 900 students, that's almost half the high school building who we could not get into the courses they wanted. That is unacceptable. That was unacceptable to us. That was unacceptable. And we think that would be unacceptable to you, the parents. And one of the reasons why is the model, if you think about it, created three different sort of student types, if you will. And I'm sorry to use that phrase, but we have our North students, we have our South students, we have our remote students. And we had two different teacher types. We had our in-person students and we had our, our in-person teachers and our remote teachers. And we have over 2000 students altogether across 1,400 sections of more than 230 individual courses. We offer 230 individual courses at Shaker High School. So if you do all the permutations, and I know I've used my Rubik's Cube metaphor one time too many, but you can see turning for North student, South student, remote teacher, in-person teacher, this 2,000 students, 230 courses, 14 sections. At the end, the weight of the schedule just couldn't hold. And so we said, we cannot have a schedule where 900 students, we, we say to the parents, sorry, this is the best we could do. We just put you in alternates and we didn't even have time to have you pick something. We couldn't do that. So in the end, after that conference call, we made the decision that the only way to offer all students access to the majority of courses they selected, and in a typical year, there are some conflicts where we just can't get everything perfectly, was to create a single school. It is Shaker High School. You are a Shaker High School teacher, whether you are at home or in the building. You are a Shaker High School student, whether you are at home or in the building. So what if we build one schedule? And so we said, let's try it, see what happens. By the end of that first day, we had cut the number of students who could not get the courses they selected in half. Within eight hours, we had cut it down to around 400 students. 
we've continued to bring it down from then. And that is why you don't have your schedules yet because now Mr. Spofford and Mrs. Fox are doing what they would typically do at the beginning of August, which is by hand going in, moving courses, moving students to balance, to make sure and to get all the courses lined up as perfectly as possible before they finally lock the schedule down. So what does this decision mean? It means that many classes will have a combination of North, South, and remote students. In some ways, that's kind of nice. These are their peers. If you're a senior, you wanna see all your friends. You don't just wanna see your friends who are in the North side of town. You don't just wanna see the South side of town and you don't just wanna see remote. You wanna see everybody. So there will be a lot of classes that we're calling blended. They'll have North students, South students, and remote students. Some remote students will have in-person teachers. So a student could be at home receiving their instruction from a teacher who they realize, hey, I know that room, that's B204. That's where, that's where my English class is, absolutely. So they might see that or they might see a remote teacher who's teaching from home. Also, some in-person students will have remote teachers with in-person teacher partners. So let's explain that. We have a few departments where we have a lot of teachers who have to be home this year. They are highly qualified, highly experienced master teachers in this district. They are phenomenal teachers. And what we realized was in order for the, the remote teachers to just have remote students, they would have too few students. And then in class, the in-person teachers would have too many students. We couldn't, we didn't have enough sections, if you will. So what does that mean if you are an in-person student who has a remote teacher? That means that you will come to school and period three, you go to a certain class and your teacher will be instructing you from home just on that one afternoon when your class is meeting in person every four days. In the morning, everybody is virtual, so it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you're north, south, remote, everybody, all teachers, all kids are virtual. But in that rotation, when once every four days you meet, you'll go to your room for period three. And we have, much like our elementary teacher force, we have a secondary teacher partnership. So there will be a certified teacher who's in the room with your students who will say, good morning, this is period three, this is class X, and um, we're gonna get ready to get started with your teacher. That teacher will open up the uh, class smart board or interactive learning board and will pull up the Zoom call and voila, modern technology, the teacher is there on the screen and will do the lesson. Again, this is the once every uh, four days and the in-person teacher will be able to supervise the students, act as a liaison if the teacher who's teaching can't see and say, oh, so-and-so over here has a question and facilitate the learning while supervising the students. So they'll have a one-to-one -one collaboration so that that teacher partner knows, okay, every day I'm in, I follow Mrs. Jones' schedule. And so therefore that partner can collaborate with Mrs. Jones, knows what's coming, can look at the Zoom lesson ahead of time, operate the technology and also supervise our students, to make sure that everybody is safe. What does this decision also mean? And I'm not even sure all those, those things above, as I said, were negative, certainly not seeing all your peers. But this decision also means that all students, regardless of in-person or remote, will have equal access to electives, to honors level courses, and to AP courses taught by our highly qualified teachers. And in the end, that was the decision that really became so evident to Mr. Core, to me, to Mr. Murphy, who was also in on that meeting. Sorry, Mr. Murphy, you were very much there this weekend. When we realized, do, do we say to the parents, sorry, we did everything we could last week and 900 of you can't get what you want. That's just not a North Colony way. That, that, that's not what it means to be a bison. We don't quit. So we said, let's redo this. Let's find a new way. Let's do better by all kids. And so um, much like the elementary teacher course, we think it's a creative solution. We're proud of it. And so let's talk about what it looks like if you have a remote student. So in the morning, 
everybody's virtual, as I said. So that means our remote learners, our North learners, our South learners, they'll all be in the same Zoom or Google Meet with their teacher, learning remotely with their teacher. These classes meet four times in an eight day cycle. So there's 120 minutes of instruction there. So it's your teacher, you're on Zoom, your teacher's on Zoom, your classmates are on Zoom. It's a class of our typical class sizes in North Colony at the, at the secondary level, excuse me, 25 to 30 students. They get their instruction, they talk with their teacher, they might go in breakout rooms, they might work on projects, et cetera. Then in the afternoon, after there's that break, when they, the students come into school, the remote learners now will have a label. You'll either be remote north or you'll be remote south. And you'll take afternoon classes on the same day that your cohort does. So if you're a remote north student, you're going to meet in person on the days when the north kids are in school, if you will. If you're a south, you're going to meet with your afternoon classes on the day that the south kids are in school. So these classes only meet, as I said, once every four days or two times in an eight day cycle. So that's a hundred minutes of instruction for these two classes across eight days. Now, depending on the course, the content, the learner needs, the delivery of instruction may look different. So how, how each teacher works with these in-person blended classes, if you will, may look different but the access to instruction will be equivalent. We know that all of our students want to connect with their peers and want to connect with their teacher. We know that all of our students want to do well, all of our students want to learn the material and our teachers want the same for all their kids. And I have not had the opportunity to be around the high school this week, but Mr. Core has been um, and the supervisors have been. And all I've heard is that teachers are everywhere working together, collaborating, of course, socially distanced with masks on because they're good rule followers, but thinking of ways to engage our students, thinking of ways to meet their needs. They are working very hard to make this model work because they've missed your kids. They've missed school since March as well. And so they may all do it a little bit differently. It may not make sense for a certain demonstration. It may be that a teacher needs to send out this 15 minute video of here's how you do this and have the kids watch it ahead of time. Somebody else might not need to do that. Somebody might assign a reading before the class. Somebody else might not need to do that. It's actually the same thing that happens in school when we weren't in a pandemic. Every room is different. Every teacher is different. From English class to English class is different, much less from English class to music class to science class. The goal is, of course, that all learners are given the instruction that they need to be successful in the course. And that matters as much to you as parents as it does to our teachers as the professionals that they are. So if you're not a wordy person, and clearly I am, and you're more of a visual person, Here's what the North, this I picked a North, North remote schedule would look like. So again, here's our definition of which schools are North and which schools are South. And this is based on your address. So whatever school zone you live in, um, if you are unsure, you can email and we could let you know which zone you're in. But also when you receive your schedule, it will say on it, even if you're a remote learner, it will say North or South. So it will be printed on your schedule. Up here we have the times of the day. Remember that it's the same, this is virtual and live for the hybrid, but it's the same time for our remote learners. Their day will start at 8.15. You'll remember from a previous presentation when Mr. Spofford talked about the schedule, that in the morning, we start with period eight, and then we go five, six, seven. And when it says, all, what that means is on day one, period eight, whatever class your remote child has, let's say they have English period eight. In this class, all students means it will be the whoever, let's say your students in um, English 11 regions. It will be period eight, English 11 regions, just like it would have been scheduled if we didn't even have this pandemic. A group of 28 kids are scheduled to English 11R in this group of 28 students will be some students who live in the north end of town, some students who live in the south end of town, and some students who will be remote students. But they're all there on day one with their teacher getting their instruction. A 
and B refers to classes that don't mean every day. So that could be like a PE class or a lab class. But if you're, I'll use English because that's the subject I taught as an example, 8A, 8B, that class meets both days. The letters never matter to, to an English teacher. It was just period eight. So all students would meet, they would have English class here and they would have English class here. Let's say period five, that's their math class. They would have math class. So across the top, you can see it's all this color pink because as a remote student, you're responsible for taking all these classes. You are doing schoolwork from 8.15 to 10.30 in the morning, taking all these classes with your classmates. So you will see your friends. And I know, I know that that matters a lot to high school kids. Like, oh, if I'm not gonna be in school, I won't get to see so-and-so. You will in these classes. So that's excellent. In the afternoon though, please note that every other day is highlighted. Because remember I said that remote students will be taking afternoon classes on the same day as their counterparts. So the North, since I pulled a North schedule, they would be taking their afternoon classes on day one, three, five, seven, and so on and so forth, because that's when the North kids were in school. If I happened to pull a South schedule, obviously days two, four, six, and eight would have been highlighted. So that the, the students who are in person are getting the same amount of, of this class as the students who are remote. So you'll see this is a, the morning gives you 120 minutes of instruction for a class that meets daily over the eight days. And in the afternoon, it is 100 minutes over the eight days because these are two 50 minute sections as opposed to these, which are half an hour section. So across the two, they, they come to an hour. So that is what the schedule looks like. Um, Mr. Murphy, I know, has published a big calendar for the year. Um, it reminds me of, of the lunch calendars we used to get that will tell you the rotation for every single day. If you have previously been in the high school and you know about the rotation schedule, you're used to looking at the schedule every day, but that will be um, available and printed and easy for people to see. I did want to make um, one mention before we take questions, and I'm sure there are plenty, um, but students who are in school, as we talked about, um, K through six will have um, lunch in their classrooms. Seven and eight will have the ability to do grab and go breakfast or, or lunch, depending on what time of the day they're in. But what about our students who are in K through 12 remote? Um, do they have access to the North Colony meal program? They absolutely do. So we will be providing meals for, rem for remote learners sh should you wish to participate. So the pickup locations will be um, behind Blue Creek Elementary School, and it will be on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday between 10 and 11 a.m. Monday and Wednesday pickup will include two breakfasts and two lunches, and Friday pickup will contain one breakfast and one lunch. Our director of food service, Lisa Ostrowski, has been working very hard this summer. Um, there have been a lot of new regulations and we're also getting um, a new ordering system. So she is working through that. You can email her. Um, it's her full name, Lisa Ostrowski at ncolony.org. She will also be sending out more information about our food program, our new, um, our new access for meals, and that will go out to families next week. Uh, Ms. Skills, we have uh, Ms. Ostrowski is here, and um, I know there's been some questions um, about uh, the computer system. Um, Lisa, do you uh, have anything you want to add to that? And there's also uh, a question. So there's a question from Dina in the chat. Is lunch free for in-person students? Is there a new app site for lunch funds? And uh, I would like you know, if you'd like to add to that, that would be great. Sure. So um, first of all, um, yes, to answer the question about school lunches, um, last Monday on August 31st, the USDA um, extended the waivers for the summer food service program until either December 31st or until the money runs out, basically. So um, basically for most of the first semester, as far as we know, and hopefully through the whole year, but we'll go with December 31st right now, um, all breakfast and lunch will be free uh, under the summer food service program um, regulations uh, for those in school and remote, no matter what your financial status are, is, the free reduced or paid. 
So I hope that answers that question. Um, we are, um, so let's talk about um, payment, online payment. We used PayPams with our uh, other point of sale systems. That has been closed down because we are going to a new one, which is called K12 um, payment.com. Uh, that is not functioning as of yet. We're working on getting our bank information in. So in the next day or two, that will be working. Um, but I would like everyone to know that the money has always been in the kids' accounts at the school level, not with pay PAMs. And the money always follows them from building to building, school grade to school grade. So if they have money in the account, don't worry about it. It will remain there. And it's already followed them um, to their new building. So um, the other is uh, the online ordering system. The online ordering system is almost there and up and running. Our menus are posted on our website right now for all areas. Um, and uh, uh, there will be a little bit of training, but the button is also on our website to go onto the online ordering where you can start setting up and you can start poking around a little bit. But again, I don't believe it's fully functioning yet. We hope to have that done by early next week. The other thing I would like to um, point I would like to make is that there are prices on things. You'll see prices on the online website. You'll see prices on the information you got in the mail this week. That is because um, the USDA just came out with this regulation, this uh, waiver last week. We needed to get the information out there. We didn't really even know this was going to be a possibility. There's folks who started in the Midwest who are probably on their uh, somewhere between four and six weeks of school already. So at least we, we have the information before we start our first day. And um, so you could just disregard that at this point in time. Again, all breakfast and lunch will be free. The other piece of information I would like to say is you did get the application, your family application in the mail. If you um, usually fill out an application and are approved for meals, I please, no matter if it's free or not right now, please fill that application out. The district uses that information for other things as we go um, into the school year, as well as the families could also use that, um, having that ability to be free, reduced or paid. Um, so that's very, very important um, that we get that, those applications in um, as much as quickly as possible, like always. That's, I, I think that's beneficial for the family as well as the district. Um, other than that, I think that's, um, that's the generalities of what's happening in the food service department. Uh, we will definitely uh, give you more information next week with more specific, make sure everything is up and running. But again, please poke around. Our menus are on the website. Our button for the online ordering is, is up there. Um, and again, just waiting on a couple of banking things and you'll be able to go online. Of course, you don't really have to put too much money in um, because the, the meals are free at this point in time. It is extremely helpful to the district that you participate in the food service program. Um, so I hope that you do at least a few times a week, if not every day, breakfast and lunch. And we do a great job. They are great nutritious meals. And uh, thank you very much, Lisa. That was important information. I know a lot of uh, families were concerned. Thank you. Before we go to questions, I because um, I'm sure there are plenty about the remote section that I just did. Um, the question that Mr. Janine asked earlier for the K through six is the same question as seven through 12. How do we get started? So we are going to begin school, as you know, on Monday, September 14th, both in person and virtually. So we will be providing directions for your child to access their respective courses through Google Classroom. So teachers will be sending an email invitation, which your child will be able to get via Gmail or Google Classroom. They're very used to this. They're, um, by this age, they are better at technology than some of us are, that's for sure. Um, once they accept the invitation, they can access the virtual classroom. And we encourage students to check their school accounts over the weekend to look for the invitations. Um, Teachers are planners, many students are planners. Um, a lot of us would have had this all sorted and organized weeks ago as a student. I would have been one of those who had everything organized. So we know this is hard that it's coming in the end, 
but please remember we're pushing it to the last minute so that we can we can meet the needs of as many students as possible and we think that's a laudable goal we are working through the supply pickup for remote students and the building um, level administrators are working on a schedule for that i know mr murphy has been talking with the um, academic supervisors about that. And I know Mrs. Lang has been talking with the academic supervisors. No student will be put in a terrible position on Monday um, without a math book and if they're a remote learner. So um, we are aware of that and we will be uh, giving you information and the building level principals will go through that because as you know, just like it did um, in the spring when we were doing um, drop off to pick up it takes coordination so that we could do it safely, efficiently, and in an organized manner. We want to remind you that if you need to reach out to someone, every, everyone is available to answer your questions. Um, your building level principals can be reached by their email addresses or you could call the school directly um, should you wish to do so. And also add on here, I've added Mr. Deneen's email and Mr. Zadorian's email if you have questions about remote learning. As you get into next week, as we start school, um, we remind you that you're, if you have a question, it's always good to start with the teacher first. Um, they are closest to the action, as I like to say. So oftentimes they know the answer that the principal doesn't know because it's something specific to their room. So you might save yourself a step and that's often a, a good way to get an answer. But you could also talk to your building principal. You could talk to those um, administrators who are overseeing the remote program as well. Um, we have emails here, and they were also sent out in Mr. Kaur's um, letter to families, and they are also posted on our website. So Mr. Kaur, if it's OK with you, I'll stop the screen sharing so that we can come back on um, all of us live to um, look at some of the questions that are in the chat. I okay. Um, so Karen has questions. There's still going to be an app for pickup. Is this info in one of the emails sent? So there will be an so for the students in grades four through six, and I don't know if Mr. Chamberlain's on the call, but um, they are um, they have made an app, which is a, just a very clever idea, because you can think about if you are used to going to an elementary building to pick up your children at the end of the day and all of the students. So now think all six buildings, well, four, two and four, because they're at two different distance times. So um, yes, indeed, there will be an app. Um, and so the, the students, no, not the students, they're not driving. The parents will be able to um, log in when they get into the parking lot. The teachers will have the computer open so in real time they can see who is there for pickup and then the children will be released and you will have certain zones that you will go to depending on um, which, particular, um, which particular school building you're at so that you're, you're close to the door that your child will come out from. And um, if Mr. Chamberlain has not communicated that, um, I know he will be, and you could also reach out to Mr. Chamberlain for that information. Um, I, Karen has a question, where is that info? I don't quite know where that information is right now. Um, I, Mr. Chamberlain has that information, and if it hasn't gone out to all parents already, um, I will certainly um, follow up with him tomorrow to make sure that we have it also on the website. Uh, Dina has a question. Can you share what uh, high school halls will house junior high halls so we can show kids on the map their hall location? I think we certainly can do that. We can publish that. Absolutely. Yes. And I know that we have, um, I know that Mr. Murphy uh, and Mr. Zadorian and uh, Mrs. Lang walked the building and went through and decided kind of which halls would be where. Um, it's not quite as clean as it is in the junior high just because of the physical setup of the high school building, but we could certainly um, get that map out and um, we could get that up on the website tomorrow. Brett says, would be great if you can send an email listing all the new apps that we need with a small description and a link. 
it would be great. Um, it's a great idea. Um, we'll try our best. Absolutely. With food service attestation, pickup, et cetera. Um, Lisa, uh, this is a question for Lisa Ostrowski from Lisa Audi. How does a parent order lunch for Monday? Uh, I believe at, uh, I'm not sure the grade level, but I, I think at the elementary levels, we're still going to do some teacher counts. Um, we will, like any other time, just have food available for any kids. We don't always know who's going to be ordering and who's not. So don't be, uh, don't be worried if you can't get on to the, uh, the new website to, to pre-order. Um, we're, we're still here to feed your kids. We'll be all set. And uh, Tabasam, can we use a regular PC for virtual sessions rather than a Google Chromebook? We'd rather have you use Google Chromebook um, because it has our tools on it. And that is, that is our strong preference. Um, Julie made a good point. The attestation is not an app. You will receive a text and a, an email. Karen, and this is for you, Lisa. Do the seventh and eighth grade students use Shaker High Launch or Junior High Menu and app? Um, no, so they would still be under the elementary menu. So the elementary schools in the junior high building will still be all under the, uh, the elementary menu. Also, I would just like to point out with the new system, I didn't mention this before, but their school lunch number is now their ID number, which is on their Chromebook, which is on their report card, which is on. So we tried to simplify things. So that is their number. Um, from okay. Dean. From Mr. Dean. Mr. Cork, can I just jump in? The, sure. the, also cool. about the lunch, there was, what about seventh and, seventh and eighth grade students? Do they use the Shaker High lunch or do they use the junior high menu and app? They are using the, well, they only, they're in for breakfast and then they will use the high school for lunch if they're going to, uh, I guess they have two options. They could pick up lunch uh, on their way out of the building. I believe we designed that system or if their parent is going to pick up remotely for any other student, they could also pick up remotely. Only one lunch per family though, per day. And uh, from Dina, if a parent or in, a, in junior high or high school need to pick up a student for an appointment, do they send in a note and the student will be sent okay. out? Uh, Mr. Murphy, do you want to comment on that? Or? Yes, uh, Mr. Kaur. Uh Yeah, it's just like any other um, day, we're going to have the student, we're, we're, we're really, We've sent out a visitor policy and we're asking parents uh, not to come in unless they have to or if there's an emergency. So you send in your note and then we would release the student like we normally would uh, given that time. Again, it's only a four hour time period. So we, we see there's gonna be a lot less student traffic coming in and out at that point. And I think uh, there's some kudos there for not having to remember a separate lunch number. Um, Always uh, one less number to remember is always an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, with the students going in remote, are the teachers going to be mindful of homework? Seems like all of the students have long zigzag type days. And I think the short answer to that question is yes. And um, I think, you know, when we are, are, are having conversations with our faculty and when our faculty um, has conversations with us. I think we are all concerned about building relationships with students in the beginning, uh, getting back into um, school, um, getting back together again. And I think uh, there is the experience of having been out since March, and then there's the whole experience of the return to school. So everybody's mindful of that. And I think it's important here to um, convince our students that they are in a safe place, um, quite frankly, that um, they're loved. Uh, we love them, we love them all, and that we have a sense of community. And um, this is their community and this is their place to be. And it's a joyful place. 
Um, and it's a joyful place, whether you're in the physical building or if you're in your home, online learning, but we're together. And that's the best part about having school start again. Um, I uh, went down to our music area today and I uh, talked to our music teachers and uh, they, to a person, they said that their phones would, phones would blow up at night recently because of kids just overjoyed about uh, returning to school. Um, you know, when you're in school, you have your people. You know, you have your robotics people, they're your people. You have your athletics people, they're your people. You have your art, art, art friends, they're your people. Your music people, they're your people. So I think it's a chance for everybody to get back with his or her people and um, get that spirit of coming together and, and being part of a community wherever we are. Uh, Dina, will the changes to the high school schedule, will the changes to the high school, with the changes to the high school schedule, how common will it be that in-person students will have remote teachers? And thank you for the clarification. Um, of the 100, and Ms. Skeels clarified that, um, it's not that common out of 100 faculty members, 17 are remote. And some of those, um, am I unmuted? Yes. And some of those remote teachers do have remote, fully remote classes. So for all of those teachers, not all of them will have those sections. So it would not be, it would not be typical for a student to come in and have two, three, four classes in a row where they're, you know, they, they had a remote teacher. It would, it, that would not be common at all. Um, Mikhail, I just want to say I saw you, I just I just finally caught up on the chat because I was talking a lot tonight. Um, and I am so excited that you are excited to come back. We literally cannot wait to see kids back in school. We uh, you bring the energy, you bring the joy, and uh, we can't wait to see you. We, we had some of our junior high students coming in to take a math test today. And, um, you know, they were here to take a math test, but we were all pretty joyful. To, and, and they were actually joyful. I think it might be a first uh, <laughs> to take that math test. And we were uh, uh, joyful to see them as well. Any other questions? So we had about uh, 380 viewers tonight. That was our high point. Uh, we will be back uh, two weeks from today. So that will be September 24. Um, to our PAC, uh, you know, we started the 4th of June and we've been, you know, going strong uh, all summer long. And so now we're ready to go. Uh, on Monday the 14th. We're excited about that. And we're gonna give everybody a break on Thursday night and enjoy getting back to school and you know, get uh, accustomed to that experience. And we'll come back together um, two weeks from now on Thursday the 24th, that's seven o'clock. So uh, to all our PAC members, um, uh, thank you. Thank you more than you can ever imagine. And to our community, um, Thanks as always, your support is um, felt, appreciated and needed. So thank you very much. Great to see you all. Have a wonderful weekend and we're ready for school. Thank you, thank you. Thanks everybody.